Thank you to Blackology Coffee Company for sponsoring this video. Take 10% off your next order at Blackology Coffee Company by using the link in the description, www.blackologycoffeecompany.com backslash Angela. Hey everybody, my name is Angela. I am your host and producer here at Honey and & Hustle. And today I'm joined by Susie Silver. She is the founder of With Pride Consulting, and now she uses her consulting skills with the diversity movement here in Raleigh. Susie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're a former educator, and then you founded your own consulting firm, With Pride Consulting. And now you decided to, instead of being a solopreneur, use those skills and contribute towards the team at the diversity movement. So can you tell me a little bit about your journey as an educator and how you got started with, with Pride Consulting? Yes, absolutely. And I'll, I'll interject. It's interesting because I, I'm still somewhat a solopreneur because I have my art business as well, which I know we don't even have to talk about today. So it's this interesting change, you know, from the art side and then also with Pride Consulting. So absolutely, let me go into education and my journey there uh, because I really want to use the platform to also share some of my story and bring light to my community so which i'll get into so yes i was in education public education for 18 years that just ended um, in february i was at the same school my whole career which is a very rare statistic <laughs> for an educator i taught high school art uh, which then makes sense with my other business and um you know the journey to dei work with Pride Consulting really started with my own story. And I fell in love with a woman <laughs> at the age of 27 and never really understanding who I was. And looking back, I do believe there were so many signs. I just didn't have the space or understanding to express those things or investigate what that meant. And um, I went through a really hard time. I was outed. Uh, in a very intense and unfortunately traumatic way. And my, my, this is now my wife. We've been together for 12 and a half years and we went through that together. Um, and a lot happened. I mean, I was diagnosed with PTSD, anxiety, depression, very intense things, very low points in my life. Uh, but I was lucky enough to have my person, her name's Anne, and also great community around me lifting me up. So that's a very quick version of the story, but it's important on how I got to what I'm doing because in, um, in the time of healing, forgiveness, transformation, I always say resolution for so much, this is many years later, um, after that first kind of event happened of being outed to school one day, me teaching, and then going into a faculty meeting and what happened is we have trainings every year as teachers. Any educators out there will probably laugh a little bit because it's like, okay, bloodborne pathogens, what you do when somebody cuts themselves, you know, and it's like, okay, we got it. But one that is very serious is suicide awareness training. It's every year, it is an in-person training. And for the first year, this is now five years ago, about seven or so years after those initial events. About five years ago um, in the meeting, we, investigate at-risk youth, at-risk subgroups. So all kinds of different factors that can make students that we see every day more at risk of self-harm, suicide, homelessness. I mean, all different types of things. And for the first time, there was a slide on LGBTQ youth. And unfortunately, that statistic that day said that LGBTQ youth are 200 to 300% more likely for self-harm or suicide. And I had a physical reaction to this because I saw myself in that statistic. I went through what I went through in my late twenties and I know how low and how hard and how intense that was. And I thought at that moment, if I was a teenager, I don't know if I would be here. I don't know if I would have had the sense to ask for help, get my community around me, know where to go. Because quite often our teens are you know, put out on the streets, they're disowned, they're, I mean, all kinds of things, which is why they're so at risk. Plus you think teenagers brains, hormonal changing, just basic life stuff. 
And I had this reaction thinking, okay, why is this slide up here? And then click to the next. This is the most at-risk subgroup out of any other youth risk factors combined. And why are we not talking about it? Why is there no training? Why do we not understand more? And this is my own community. And I also realized that I had that question and I realized I need to tell my story. One, for maybe some healing for myself, continual healing. And two, I think that story can help. And so I went to my principal and I said, I have this major reaction in this you know, meeting. He knew who I was, you know, very supportive. And I said, I wanna do something about this. I wanna talk to teachers. I wanna talk to staff. I don't know what that looks like yet. He said, go for it. What, whatever you do, you got my support, which mind you, a public school in North Carolina to have a principal say, you can talk about LGBTQ anything was a big deal. So that person empowered me to be a leader in a different way than I had already led through the school. I had held many leadership positions over the years, which I appreciate. Um, I developed a training. I kind of pulled, I, I got another teacher on board with me and we just pulled resources, anything free we could get. We pulled it together and we made our own two-part training. We got teachers in. I mean, people, what does the acronym mean? You know, how do I um, use pronouns correctly? How can I do inclusive lesson planning and not be afraid? You know, because again, we're in public school. Um, how do I support, you know, my peers? Someone like me, some people didn't even know. Um, and we just had these awesome and pretty tough conversations, you know, of what to do to support youth. Well, I worked within the school for a couple years and then it went to the school system and I worked with the school system for about two and a half, three years. At the same time, my friends in corporate, this is how we get to with Brad Consulting, my friends in the corporate world were just hearing what I was doing, you know, telling my story, doing these trainings. And they said, um, can you come to our business and do the same training because I don't know what the acronym is, or I don't know what to say. I don't understand coming out. I, I don't know what that means if one of my peers is tr in transition. You know, I don't understand. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't want to mess up. And those right there, right, that transcends so much of even what's been going on, not just this year, but in general. So why people don't speak up or act because of the fear and confidence. And so. I started going to corporate gigs and I thought, well, I guess I need to establish a business because I wanted to look professional. That's with Pride Consulting and it just started rolling. And I will say through COVID time for the business, it grew exponentially through COVID because my schedule did wind up being more flexible. My teaching schedule was different. I interjected gigs whenever I could. I talked to as many people as possible and it just, it just flew. And I knew I'd be stepping away from teaching probably within the next two years. One, because of the art business and being sustainable for a few years at, at one financial level. And then this business was growing and not just with the finances and being able to help support my family, but that's not sustainable. I'm teaching full time. I'm working on my art business. Um, I'm working on this consulting business. I'm a wife. I'm a mother of two. It was like, everybody kept saying like, how are you, how are you doing this all Susie? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm not, you know, like I, I it's not sustainable, but I'm so passionate and I know this will work not just as a business, but it is needed. So even if it's not me, that's the vessel, like we have to take this somewhere. So that's how I got into the work. And then to end, how did I get to the diversity movement? I was in a lot of virtual speaking arenas in the last year since they started with their founders, with some of the team. And then every, every time I networked, somebody would say, hey, Susie, you know who you need to talk to? Who? Someone at the diversity movement. <laughs> and it was kind of funny. I actually just told that story to some of my team yesterday. And it was every single call. I'm talking like, I mean, we met through networking. like. Every single call I was on, it was Susie, you gotta, you gotta talk to the diversity movement or they need to talk to you because there are not that many, especially in this area, LGBTQ subject matter experts. There's only a couple of us. And so, you know, 
the story goes, but they we started in contact. I was then um, on a panel that one of their founding um, members or founding team um, moderated. We got to talking. I talked to the CEO. I talked to a couple other people. I presented. I wrote something, and then it was like, here's an offer, and oh, it, it was a gift. I mean, I know I worked to get to this place. And I had a decision to make about my business because it's basically absorbed. With Pride Consulting, absolutely still exists. People can contact me there, the website's up. I mean, it's an entity of itself, which remains. Um, but somewhat myself and what I do is absorbed into the diversity movement. I had to decide, what do I wanna do with my business? And I thought, what a rock star, talented team doing really important work at a very high level, in my opinion. Um, Let's do this because also I'll be honest, I'm not so great at the numbers. I'm not so great at the contracts. I'm all that stuff. And so, you know, as a solopreneur now and hiring out to, we do it all. We book our stuff. We pay the bills. We, we figure out our social media content. We do it all until we can then branch out. And I was at that point and I thought, I have a team. I have an instant, amazing structured team and we get to do the work like faster, larger, and that's the purpose. I started this to make the difference, not even knowing it turned into a business and let alone a career change. So that's the story. I apologize if that was long, but I really love to tell the scope of it because it comes from an authentic place of something I went through. Doesn't mean that I'm any better, any different. It just, this is who I am. I will no longer be afraid of it. I will no longer be anything but authentic. And if anything I could say can help someone or spark a conversation, let's go. You know, I want to do that. And I fully believe we're all on a journey of allyship and learning in this space. And how can I help you? You know, that's what I say to people. How can I help? We're on a journey. And this journey we have to be in the mindset is for the rest of our life. It's not, we aren't on a sprint. We're marathon, marathon, marathon. And the mindsets, you know, from myself and my approach and the diversity movement, just they're completely locked and aligned. And I was like, this is it. I'm, I'm going. So that's, that's how I got there. Long winded. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. That's good. I'm, I'm glad that you talked about the breadth of that story because there's so many parts I want to like dig deeper into and yeah. just pick apart for people who yes. and just don't know you the way that I have had the pleasure of getting to know you through networking. So um, one thing that was interesting in your story, and when we traditionally think of allies, we think of people who are not on the LGBTQIA spectrum, right, being allies, but you yourself are an ally, and you're on that spectrum as well, because you saw this, and instead of saying, I need to give this to someone, you said, I'm going to take this on, and I'm going to work to get this message out there and create a space where we can have these type of conversations within the workplace, um, and within your school specifically. So what was that like for you and what advice do you have to other people who are on the spectrum or not about being just a great ally in a professional environment? Oh, allyship, you know, I'll go back to some of these themes. There's the, the things that I truly believe get in the way of allyship are things I mentioned, the fear, the confidence, you know, uh, being afraid to do or say the wrong thing. Here's the deal. We're all going to mess up. We're going to continue to mess up. It's better to mess up. This is my opinion. Not everybody will agree with me. It's better to mess up than not say something or do something. So I think, you know, as an ally, putting the work on yourself, you know, I, as an, somebody in an underrepresented community, I have, like you just said, I've put that work, I have taken that on. That is my thing, but not everybody wants to be the educator for everyone else. It's exhausting, you know, and I actually have to be very careful on my energy levels and like mental and emotional levels of, how many speaking gigs do I do a week? How many, you know, uh, things do I do? Cause I have to balance and I've learned that. So when you're an ally, it's okay to ask questions too, to people, but always put the work back on you. You know, for example, Hey Susie, I would really love to understand more about your story. Um, I know that's a big thing. So if, and when you ever want to chat, please know that I am, I'm ready. So not just saying, so tell me about, um, being outed, <laughs> you know, cause I may have just like, I'm tired. I might have a cold. I might have like, you know, I'm like, wait, hold on. We're supposed to be eating a salad or something. I don't know. And I might not be in that place or something major in the news. 
in our country, in our world may have just happened. And no, I don't want to talk about those things. And let's take that outside of my community. Let's think about this whole, not just this year. I mean, my work started way beyond, before that, but I do recognize a lot of allies have really come into allyship this year. And thank goodness for that. And there's so much work to do. And it's okay, again, you're on this journey. Um, check in with your people. That's another tip for allyship, just check in. I, I do it to friends and I have friends, family, like I, they know stuff's going on or I have a big week, as exciting as that is. They know sometimes it's emotionally exhausting. I just get texts like, hey, you got this, you're doing so great. Or how are you this week? Or I'm here if you wanna talk or send me a silly like video or something. So in ways of checking in and a good thing, if something is going on as an ally, you wanna check in. Hey Susie, I saw this on the news. I'm thinking about you, no need to message back. I just need you to know I'm thinking about you. Again, you're putting it, you're not putting anything on that person in an underrepresented group or that has been through something. And so I hope that answers the question, but just that allyship of being very in tune to what is outside of yourself, which is a statement on privilege too. Privilege is not a dirty word either. I can go into that another day. I'll talk about some stuff maybe later. I'm doing a really cool event next week with a diversity movement on privilege. But, um, and people think, well, when that word comes up, we're just talking about race. We're, we're in general, we're talking about it. We all have bias and we all have privilege. It's what we do with that. Whether we haven't had much or we've had a lot, that's where your empowerment comes in. How are you going to lead? How are you going to be an ally? How are you going to talk? Like all these different things, um, which branch out from that allyship umbrella. Yeah. Um, so in talking about just being an ally in the sense that, you know, that comes in different times and different places. And there's certain times when having conversations are more conducive or better than others. Um, and you talk about like how as people and a part of the LGBTQIA community, like there may be other things happening in life, in the world that, you know, may affect their like willingness to talk about their experience and what's going on with them or what they're feeling. And from, I guess, like a business owner perspective, from a team perspective, from a professional environment perspective, like there's things happening every week. I mean, if you go on the news, if you just wanted to look and nitpick, you could find yes. something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But every week that could potentially be like negatively affecting someone. So how do allies and just people who are business leaders, people who are team leaders, people who are working in professional environments alongside other people who may be along the spectrum, how do we find a balance, if balance is the right word, between um, creating a space where they can come and talk to you about things, allowing them and acknowledging that things may be heavy at that time for people in their community, but also not actively, preemptively giving them excuses not to be as productive in the workspace or as responsive or, or things like mm -hmm. that. Right, and I, this is a great question and something that I think we're talking about every day in every training, every company we're working at because this notion of that productivity or something's going on, what actually is starting to happen is a shift of it's kind of okay, you know? So like this balance of the productivity or creativity, there is data to support. If you have those safe places, if you feel like you can bring your authentic self, if you can say like, hey, I don't think you all know, but like I have an autoimmune disease. Like I am, it's rough today, you know, just like not to complain, but that space. And then actually then given the space to maybe not be productive for that week or you know so there's this balance and this shift starting to happen where you know we're encouraging to get to know your people more and as when you get to know your people more it's like you're saying like from leadership managerial um it's in the corporate sense um this line this book the chapter in the book that was like you don't talk about your personal life at corporate work, that line is blurring and that chapter is starting to be shredded. Now, does that mean we have to know everything about everyone? Absolutely not. And that's like up to us in, as individuals, what we want to share, not share. Um, but the idea of it's okay to share more of yourself, to bring more of yourself, to ask more about 
that is starting to shift in a major way. And we're just at the beginning, so it's super uncomfortable for people. So I don't have a great answer other than, hey, actually, that's a conversation happening now. Um, and um, I think we're finding out like even newer terms like neurodiversity, like understanding how you work and I work are gonna be different. So if I say have ADHD, you do not, the way we actually work as a team is shifted because we need to know that about each other. But it's for so long, it's been, don't say anything about that. It's gonna maybe make you seem not as smart or not as productive or not. Mm -mm. As soon as we can like fine tune all that, your teams are gonna be on fire, unstoppable. And then within the community, there's also, there's just so much fear. In a lot of my talks, I, I go into very specific data about how much, as much progress has been made or seems to have been made. Um, people in my community, they're really afraid a lot of times to be their authentic self. Um, I think it's like, now this study was from HRC, Human Rights Campaign. I think it was two years ago. Um, they do big surveys every couple of years. It's like 46% of US LGBTQ workers are closeted at work. Still, so, and again, this is now a couple years old. I would assume some shift in that. Um, there is something like one in 10, and I, I'll like give you a note if I'm wrong on this one, I'll make sure I'm checking you. But one in 10 workers have heard their own like leader, manager make a negative remark. It could be a microaggression, I don't know, about the community. That statistic has not changed since 2008. So let's, I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll be done answering that question on it, but it's so we can be us and not to duck out of meetings or like, be like, hey, I'm off my call today, but just to be like, this is what I need to be more productive, creative, effective, which then affects that bottom line that companies need to keep this way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think that's, that was a good answer to it because again, like, you know, as so, a solo entrepreneur or previously solo entrepreneur who's now like hiring people and stuff like that. It's something that, you know, we have to think about in this, I would say like new age of entrepreneurship where a lot more people are looking to build creative teams, build small teams, build startups, whatever that means for people. Um, but like how it's not just about hiring the right people with the right skill sets, it's about hiring them, yes, but providing them with an environment where they can be successful. Mm -hmm. That's how we do that, right? When you're working with diverse, diverse people and with different backgrounds, different experiences, through life, through education, through work, all these type of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's. I'm glad that we're having this conversation. I'll yeah. say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad. Yeah. And I mean, it's not to say that people aren't to be held accountable, right? Like, and I know you didn't think that's what I said. I just want to make a note of that. There's systems and structures to create and change and make better to hold people accountable, you know? And a lot of that has to do with trust. I mean, my, who I directly report to, it's like, I don't care if you work at midnight. I don't care if you work at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., whenever it is, you wanna take a nap at lunch if you need that or take a walk. You know, we have people on our team, like have to do a yoga or, you know, take a run or something like that. As long as you get your work done, and if we have a deadline, it is met, until you prove me otherwise, I trust you. I've never been in that environment coming from public education. That's just an example where now I've had great leadership for my school, always, always. Um, but like, you're never treated as a professional. Mm. And like I said, even like before we got started, I've never understood. I came, I have been ingrained with a culture of your mind and your body and yourself come last. It's nobody's fault. It's the culture of public education, honestly. Um, and I'm in a big learning curve with that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm now in an environment where it's like, oh, I, I've been taking my dog for a walk and I feel like I'm doing something bad because I don't know any different, you know? And I'm so grateful to be in this time. I'm 40 years old learning this, you know? Um, but that, so that's just like even more on that. Just like, how can we create some of these structures to yes, hold people accountable, give them some trust space get to know them what do you need you know i had that i i disclosed i am very productive in the morning when we get into that 3 p.m to 5 30 p.m thing i'm good i'm gonna be on because that's my job but woof, don't ask me to like write something from scratch you know or like and i know that's gonna come and i said i recognize that can't be all the time but if you're asking me this is so 
it's noted. Yeah, so, um, yeah. it's something very, very interesting that I've gotten kind of touched on this with other guests as well, which is having kind of like an unhealthy relationship with work, right? Yes. When we with other people and then going into this um, entrepreneurial space, startup space, small business, local small business owner space where it's, you know, a little bit different, right? You know, you're trusted to, to do your job and work to uh, meet deadlines, but also have the latitude to work, um, in a like in a way that is most productive for you right um and so when we talk about you know i think there's like people who you know have either been laid off by the pandemic or seen like hey like this job doesn't pay me enough to, to really live effectively or you know my spouse may have gotten laid off and i don't make enough to support my family without that extra income and they're looking to you know start side hustles be their own boss start you know a small business of their own and i think there's some people floating around which is what in what they're calling the creator economy which is people who are creative entrepreneurs and who are kind of like they make a decent living you know what i mean they're not starving artists they're kind of fighting that trope um and they're pushing the fact that they feel like everybody's going to be an entrepreneur in some way shape or form which i do not agree with um and i may get some flack for that as a creative yeah. entrepreneur but i mean the reality is not everybody can be at the top not everybody wants yeah. to be at yeah. the top and just because you want to be at the top doesn't mean that you have what it takes to be successful right I think there is still a space for people to work collaboratively with small businesses, startups, things like that, smaller structures, again, where people have a more personal relationship mm -hmm. with the people that they hire and the people that they work with and the people that they collaborate with on a regular basis. Um, but again, it's going back to that conversation of how, what is our responsibility as business leaders, as entrepreneurs to create an environment where people feel that they have agency on the job. Or people feel they are comfortable and are comfortable and have an environment where they can be themselves, right? right. Um, so, what are some things that you cover in your workshop with corporate uh, businesses and corporate? Um, I guess businesses is the right word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It kind of like you forget about that fact when it gets to be these large. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Structures that nobody knows what, but like. What are some things that you cover in those workshops that kind of help them put into perspective how they can, even with larger teams, even when people, again, may not be accustomed to having that personal relationship with their mm -hmm. um, coworkers, um, what are some things that you have kind of helped them to understand and shift their perspective on in terms of allyship in the workplace? Allyship in general, allyship in the workplace, um, inclusive language is key, you know, starting to learn and practice new new language, which is really hard, you know, um, let's get away, you know, one of the specific tips I give, let's try not to say good morning, ladies and gentlemen, you know, just in, in reference to my community, as soon as you do that, you're, you're in, locked in a binary, you've excluded so many people that are on a different gender spectrum than you know, male, female. So that, so inclusive, like that was a specific um, example to my community, but inclusive language can really help um, when you're speaking, when you're getting to know people and also in company documents, reviewing for different types of inclusive language. Um, again, getting to know people just, you know, sometimes even um, correcting yourself, admitting when you're wrong, uh, it's not mine. I, I believe it's from Amber Cabral. I don't know if you know of Amber Cabral. She's all over the internet, but she, I believe she came up with this. Um, when you mess up, I'm sorry for moving forward. I will. It's genuine. You know, you can make it your own. It puts it on you. I've recognized I've done this moving forward. I will. And then you can always say, you know, more to that, but that's a really great ally tip because again, we're going to mess up. Um, and that's okay. Speaking up at whether it's a leader or a peer, speaking up when you see something or you hear something that is just not sitting well. That could be any type of very big aggression to usually a microaggression. The microaggressions in the workplace often go kind of unnoted. You know, um, oh, Susie, like, she doesn't look gay. Okay, what does that mean? Why did that come out? And so you could say, you know, somebody could say, I'm just giving really specific LGBTQ stuff, but in general, whatever that could be, you could interject anything else and just say, you know, hey, Angela, um, can we talk? You know, let's get on a Zoom or whatever. I heard you say this in the meeting. And again, put it on you. I am 
super hypersensitive. I'm on a really big ally journey right now. That really was uncomfortable for me because we, we can't, Describe da 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 da. This is why it bothered me. D did you know that that could really offend somebody? Or, and most of the time, people were like, I don't even what I say, you know. And really, people are like, it doesn't really go that well, Susie. I will tell you, most of the time, when you call people in, so you call people in, call people forward instead of calling them out. So, what you know, you called that out, but you're bringing them in. Do you want to talk about that? This is why it's really bothersome to me. And you're like, you, why are you spending your time on this? You can say, because it's important to me. This is going to make a difference. So that was a really specific example. But speaking up, people want to feel seen, safe, and heard. I see that all the time, right? And so if you can be the catalyst for that, do it. Is it uncomfortable? Sure. Allyship is most of the time <laughs> uncomfortable because it's outside of you, you know? And, um, so speaking up, getting to know your people, inclusive language, recognizing, recognizing your biases, we all have them, recognizing our privileges, and start working through what do you do with those things. And no, it's not gonna happen. Oh, I took an unconscious bias workshop, I'm good to go. That's not, it can help you start. We've got great workshops, I love doing them, you know. What, what goes beyond that? Yeah. So that I hope that helps. Those are really specific categories that, you know, of course I can do hours of stuff on, but um, being aware. Most of us now, at least most of us now kind of have that like that inner radar that just like goes off when you're like, okay. And in years past, it was okay to stay silent. This is no longer the case. And we, we all know that a lot, you know, a lot of us in this space doing work have known that, you know, always, but we all have work to do. Doesn't mean I know any more or any less. It's just that we are, we are called to action, no longer be silent. And there's ways to approach. And, um, I actually talk about how to deescalate if somebody's very, doesn't usually happen, but yeah. Okay, thank you so much for breaking that down a little bit more and giving that really good example because again, like speaking out is uncomfortable for a lot, a lot of people, right? And so like, again, going to a workshop is great, but like it's a continual practice and like how can we put that into practice? And that's having these conversations and here's a good example of how to do that. And I really like that. And I think the virtual thing, I think it's still going to be a thing after this, right? Because I think people feel more comfortable on virtual than they do going into a conference room or going, you know, like making a scene out of physically being in a place where people may not feel like that's neutral territory or whatever. But more often than not, if you're on a virtual call, then you're somewhere comfortable, safe, quiet, you know, isolated so you can have these type of conversations. So I feel yeah. like that's a good, a good pro tip. Yes. And actually, and, and absolutely. And something to actually add, because I would be so sad I didn't say this uh, for leaders in corporate as well. Think about who you're amplifying. If you take stock and keep yourself accountable, again, because of societal norms and corporate culture that has been decided before any of these leaders came along, there's some, there's a, not some, there's a lot of bias. So who are you amplifying? That was another one. I'm sorry, I just forgot. Based on what you said, I was like, ooh, ping. Because, yeah, who, who's, gonna pitch to the new client who's not are you and and this is happening and i know people are uncomfortable for example in my community look i'm i'm a white femme presenting female you know cisgender okay what if i was somebody non-binary that expressed meaning with my clothes and how i present in what is an untraditional way i don't even like that way of thinking, but I'm using in terms that people can relate to. There are a lot of people in corporate America afraid to put the person that identifies as they, them, maybe with long hair, but where's the tie that has the make, you know, like all these different expressions. It's, it's a lot of the expressions and the assumptions that come from those expressions. Who are you amplifying? How many, you know, people of color have you said, you know what? That's the next manager. And it may be so unconscious 
So we have to recognize that's the bias coming in. You know, what's professional? Oh, I can't wait. I'm working on this. I've been working on it for a long time. What, I don't know when it's all going to come out, but like, what, what is professional and who decided that? Yeah. Probably. So, and, and again, it's not to like knock or beat probably white corporate culture, how you dress, how you present, how your hair is, how your makeup, is, you know? So all of us think that this is like, this is up, this is coming, you know? And it's like, okay, now we're aware. You cannot look away. You cannot stop. Who are you amplifying? So, yeah, I'm just not passionate at all. <laughs> you can tell me. <laughs> oh, oh, I think we have time for for one more because I do want to yeah. get on this, and I wasn't expecting yeah. to talk about this, but I'm so glad that you mentioned it. Which is amplifying voices, right? As somebody who is in the digital media production space, that is a lot of what I do through video, through photography, through all those things. But in a corporate sense, obviously I wasn't in corporate America for very long, but that is a whole other struggle because again, like when you don't think about it, when it's unconscious, when you really feel like, you know, I'm promoting people based on, you know, their contributions to the team and to the company and things like that. Um, and it's like, well, what do we define as contributions? And do we know those contributions better because these are the people that we hang out with, right? Um, and what do we define as profession? I mean, just, we don't have to get into that, but, <laughs> then, but when we talk about amplifying voices is do we not want to amplify this person because we feel like they're unprofessional, right? If they present in a way that is, we may deem, you know, not as acceptable or not as palatable or not as digestible as somebody who is kind of, um, looks similar to what people may already be familiar with in a lot of ways. Right. Yeah. Um, and so what, this is a loaded question, but I, I think, <laughs> We can tackle it. I think we can tackle it. But like in, uh, I would say a business environment, in a business environment, when it comes to amplifying voices and really um, creating an atmosphere where minority communities, minor underrepresented people have um, and feel agency and advocating for themselves when that new role comes up or, you know, they want to have an idea that they're pitching or maybe they want to be a part of this committee X, Y, Z. Or maybe even they, you know, just want to learn a new skill that who knows what they'll do with it, you know, just to help them be better at their job. What are some things that business leaders can do, maybe who have taken this time over the pandemic to really take stock of how inclusive and how they've, they've been as a company or how they created an atmosphere of belonging or have not created an atmosphere of belonging for people? Um, what are some ideas that you have for them in terms of really like, doing the hard work and saying, Hey, we haven't gotten it right, but we're trying. Um, yeah. I, oh yes. Big question. Uh, you know, looking at your hiring practices, uh, first of all, you know, and then kind of going from there. So looking at, um, how are you hiring, you know, uh, taking, maybe take names off of things. Cause sometimes when you hear an, or see a name it, by accident, it's our bias, right? Um, expanding, demographic options instead of male, female, other, like nobody wants to be othered, you know, first of all, <laughs> you know, expanding those things. So from the hiring practices and then interviewing practices, you know, having, um, kind of a streamlined thing where, where it is, uh, you can track how you're asking questions, what questions you're asking, how you're interviewing, um, where companies are recruiting from reaching out to, um, HBCU, you know, like, like different, different pools of recruitment from sources that would maybe feel different or not accepted in the past or something and really honing in on where the talent is from different and diverse places. So that's kind of in like recruiting and hiring and interviewing really quick. Um, you know, and then I think how as a leader you manage you know, do you trust? Is there in, and also I'll back up in the company, say it's a larger company. What are the ways to move through the company that should be clearly defined. And actually quite often it's not defined as clearly as possible. It's like, there's a lot of people saying, well, I don't actually know if I'm here this long, does it mean that I'm promoted or how do I get promoted or how I want to get to this leadership level or on the board one day? Like, what is it that I can do to work? And that should be documented. Now, can it change? Yes. Are there other circumstances that could play into that? Absolutely. 
but your teams, your employees need to know that there is opportunity because if they do, that's going to motivate a lot of people. Not everyone. Emotive. I'm a person. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going that that way, <laughs> you know, and I want to know what I can do and, and be productive and be responsible, you know, and, and earn that. Um, and because what happens if that's not, well, it's not equitable, right? It wouldn't be equitable. There's no way. And, and or equal, right? So it has to be equal and then it has to also be equitable because um, we all we know there's a difference there. And so, you know, outlining that path of progression. And then also then I'll go back to how do you lead, you know, um, open door policy or one-on-ones with your team every week, um, you know, or every quarter, whatever it is, what ideas do you have? You know, what are we talking about? What are you wanting? What are you struggling with? What are you, all these different things. And then that leader has to make sure that their people feel trusted that then if it's your idea, it's, hey, Susie, meet so-and-so. You had a great idea. I want you to pitch that. You know, instead of the leader saying, well, thanks for bringing this to me, I will present to you. No, start bringing other people in um, and changing that path a little bit. And of course that depends on the business and how things are run, all that stuff. I'm just giving generalizations. Um, and recognizing who's talking and not talking in meetings. Now I'll say that there's a lot of diversity within that. There are introverts, there are extroverts, there's combinations. So just because I'm not talking in the meeting doesn't mean that I, I don't want to contribute or that I'm not engaged or something, but I may be the person that needs to be in the meeting end the meeting, go have lunch and then say, Hey, Angela, can I talk to you in two days? I've got some thoughts or ideas. Me, if it's like Sus true me, I'm like, Oh, Oh, like I've got 700 ideas. <laughs> you know, I, like me, I'll talk, you know, I'm an extrovert. And so, but I do have introverted moments where I'd want to sit and watch. It's rare, like I'll, I'll watch, but I'm computing as I'm extroverting. So, but paying attention to those personality things um, and, and maybe saying, hey, Angela, I noticed, you know, in meetings, you're a bit quiet. I'm not upset by that. What is your, like getting to know your people, what's the best way for you to contribute? Because I really do want to hear what you have to say. With that, I don't want to put you in a spot in the meeting. Um, do you want to email? Do you want to have one-on-ones? But I, I just want you to know, I really love your opinion and I want your ideas. Like those are really specific things, but those things aren't happening all the time. And they actually can be quite easy changes. A lot of times people think about allyship and like this, the include, there's a lot of work, but those little things work. And so that goes back to then, then you're amplifying. So if you add it up all the times you did just those few things, can you imagine what can happen in a company or on your team? It's amazing. So that was a quick version, <laughs> which wasn't so quick. <laughs> I really appreciate you really taking on that beast of a question. Cause I know it's a lot, but I think you gave people a lot of value and a lot of really good ideas and tips and things to think about too. Right, as we go into this new season where things are opening back up a little bit. For reference, for people that are watching, it is the end of March right now. So, <laughs> you know, as things are getting, I don't want to say back to normal, but as people are going back into maybe a physical work environment instead of working remotely from now on, like things to think about for sure. So, oh, absolutely. And I think us as the whole world, you know, but let's talk about our country in general, not just the pandemic what has happened during the pandemic, when we come back, or if we come back, right? Like you say, as we come back into spaces, every single one of us, for the most part, I won't say every single one, most people, we are different on so many levels that need more support. Our work habits have changed. Our day-to-day -day has changed. Our emotions have changed. Many of us have been traumatized to degrees that we have never been traumatized before in the last year, you know, and employers have got to pay attention to that. It's not, and you said like normal, you know, and hang up on that word. There is no, no that life is over and we have to, there's a lot of emotional stuff. I'm, I'm dealing with that. What do we, is it a mourning process? Like, what is it? of that that was prior to March of last year and what is coming, 
I know some of it's going back to, you know, we can go play, but it's still all different. Are we going to hug people? Can we shake somebody's hand? No, you know, can we, how many people are in the conference room? Are we going to be masked? Like who's vaccinated? All of these things, this is more diversity. So there needs to be more inclusion because we're all coming. The same Susie that could have been in that boardroom a year and a half ago is not the same one that would be walking in now. And for, I think a lot of us. So I encourage leaders to pay attention to that for themselves and how you can lead and then for your people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. And thank you again for joining me here today. Oh, yeah, I love it. <laughs> but I think you killed it. I think you had a great conversation and I just really appreciate you. Yes. Oh, thank you. This was so fun. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.